Hello, welcome to Furious Driving, and today I've jumped back to the 1980s, well, the early 90s with this one, with a 1994 Suzuki Vitara Mark I. When did you last see one of these on the road, and certainly not one as clean as this? This is a car that Suzuki called a cross-country four-wheel drive with urban design. Basically, it's a vehicle that predated the SUV phenomena by being a tiny, compact, serious off-roader that was planned to live in an urban environment. So yeah, very far ahead of the game. Who knew what was coming around the corner? This car is currently for sale at Stone Cold Classics at Rutum in Kent, so check out their website in the link in the description. And don't forget while you're there to hit the like and subscribe button if you like reviews of interesting and different cars. Now on with the review. Proud to be sponsored by Diamond Bright, the car care products that have been keeping the Furious fleet looking their best for a long time already. To find all you need to keep your car clean and protected, follow the link below to diamondbright.co.uk. Hello, welcome to Furious Driving, and today we're going back to the 1980s when SUVs weren't really a thing, but off-roaders were. And Suzuki, a company who were known for making tiny urban K cars and tiny but serious off-roaders, decided to combine the two facets of their company and make a slightly larger urban off-roader, which was seriously small, but still seriously good off-road. And it took the world by storm. It was the ultimate fashion accessory of the late 80s into the 1990s. And you would not have been surprised if this was the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles company car. I'm shocked there wasn't a transformer of this. Maybe there was, and I just didn't notice. But anyway, this is the Mark I Suzuki Vitara. Now, it's no secret this thing was a runaway success, and that is due in large part to its styling, the way the thing looks, which is just brilliant, frankly. It captures the zeitgeist of the moment perfectly. We've got the straight edges, we've got the chunky, bulbous looks that look so, so very, very 1980s, but slightly curved off as we go into the 1990s. So it was on trend perfectly. Then you have these amazing wheel arches, big box flared arches, like on a Mark I Escort rally car, of course. When you think of Vitara, you don't generally think of this, which now looks quite restrained in comparison to the special editions. I say special editions. The cars we saw so much of the time were the modified ones with the enormous box arches, the pink and turquoise neon stickers all down the side, the massive graphics, the big wheels. Modifying one of these things and sticking a huge audio install was absolutely the thing to do in the early 1990s, especially if you got the convertible, because at launch in 1988, there were two body styles. There was this three-door hardtop with this enormous glass area. You can see so much into this car, it's incredible. There was also a two, well, call it two and a half door convertible. So same front half, roll bar just here, like on a Land Rover Freelander in the late 90s. They kind of borrowed that idea as well. I think the Frontier might have done that too. It wasn't until later that a five-door came out. Now as well as its compact dimensions, which make it great for running around the city, look how much space is underneath this car. You don't need to jack it up to do work under there, just roll on underneath it. 15-inch steel wheels, semi-off-road tyres, this thing is pretty much unstoppable. I am quite curious about this little styling facet just here. This little cutout on both sides of the bonnet. It looks like it's like an air intake or something. In fact, on later model Range Rovers and Discoveries, this actually is an air intake up on the side of the bonnet. So when you're wading, it draws in air up here. However, on this car, it doesn't go anywhere. It just goes loosely into the engine bay. It's just another styling thing. Right, let's take a look around the car. Now, first of all, we've got our flush fitting door handles here, pop that open, and then we get quite a thin door, but then it does maximize interior space. Now, first of all, let's look at the door card. It is like a black, soft touch, vinyl material. There's like a millimeter or so of give of padding behind this black elephant hide surface, and it's all, what, just black, vast, and fairly spartan. We've got a, uh, interestingly, L-shaped angled door handle here, plastic, as you can tell. It's like a plasticky door pull. And we have this circle here and blanking plate where you can see there was a manual wind-up window. Well, maybe not there was. More likely it only created one pressing and the cars with electric windows just got a blanking plate. There is a tiny narrow door pocket down here and that's kind of the extent of your door furniture here on the three door. Seats, they look kind of sports car-ish, these bucket-like side bolsters. Nice, interesting 1980s pattern with a houndstooth, uh, turquoise and light blue and grey. Very attractive. And our alien-headed headrests on their boingy necks. There's another word for it, but boingy, I'm afraid. 
Now, let's move into the interior. Three pedals because this is the manual. There was a four-speed automatic option if you really wanted to go slowly. This has got the five-speed manual in it though. We'll come to that in a moment. Now, let's first of all look at our T-shelf options. This is incredibly good. Suzuki, one of my favorite companies, one of the most practical and well thought out manufacturers in the world. They've given us an epic T-shelf just here where you can place food, drink, anything you want. It will not fall off. It's protected by a bar there. So yes, teacups, biscuits, any off-roading snacks will remain safe in this well-guarded T-shelf area. Next to that, we've got another little practical recess for small items, chocolate bars maybe. And then across here, we have a binnacle. Now this kind of mirrors the original Range Rover school of design, where as you can see, this isn't a molded front area where we've got the Vitara badge just here. This is a, uh, a pushed in extra bit of plastic. And over here, this binnacle area is a bolted on little pod. So if you're going from right hand drive to left hand drive, just swap places with this little bar here and this little pod here, and you've got yourself a global worldwide component from just one pressing. Very, very economical design, very clever. The little pod itself only contains a speedometer running up to 100 miles an hour. I believe the top speed on this thing is 87. Uh, rev counter running up to, well, redlining at 6,500 RPM, fuel gauge, temperature gauge, and a little semicircular arc of lights that are not currently lit. Let's light them up for you. Wow, excitement abounds. There we have it. To the right of that, we do have an angled air vent mirrored over on the passenger side. And let's move forward to the steering wheel, or backwards, I should say. This is rubbery plastic. It's not leather. It looks like leather texture, but it's not. It's a hard rubbery texture. We've got a big button for our hazard warning light just there on top of the, the steering column. And we have a horn here in the center. No airbag, it's too early for that horn test. Ooh, that's actually a slightly frightened pop. Scared Parpy, that's a new one. Now behind the Scared Parpy steering wheel, we have got a few little very square buttons. These are interesting how, well, um, how blocky they are. They are beautifully 1980s. Uh, so we've got our mirror adjustment here with this lovely designed by Van Gelis. I know he did music. Um, mirror adjuster with the triangles on it. Fog lights, rear screen heater, unlock and open the back boot all on these buttons here. And on the left hand side, rear wiper, rear washer. On these beautiful little square blocks, it's fantastic. So 1980s, I love it. Uh, below that we've got our speakers down here in the bottom of the dashboard and our stalks are concealed neatly by the steering wheel. Lights and indicators on the right and our wipers on the left. Moving into the center of the car, we have got the usual accoutrement. We have got air vents, which are like the ones on the side. They go up and down, as you would expect, but lateral movement is with these things here, but we don't have an on-off individually per vent, only on the main dial, which is located below it. And it's left and right clicking sliders. Oh, love it. it takes me back to the 90s, simpler, happier times. Again, a clicky slider for the temperature and recirculate or not. Let's go for a recirculate, get some fresh air today. Now this car has something you will never see in today's market. Even Dacia have moved away from this with their cheapest car in the market thing. We've got a blanking plate instead of a radio. This has to be one of the last non-budget cars where you could specify no radio. Incredible. Now, this car has only done 26,000 miles from new, which is astonishing. The one lady owner, I believe it was, barely used it. Maybe she didn't think she was gonna be in the car long enough to justify turning the radio on, who knows? Uh, below that, little round drum-like um, digital clock. Tiny ashtray, never been used. A cigarette lighter, again, never been used. Fantastic stuff. Then we have quite a rubbery gear selector. Rubbery in feel, rubbery in action, rubbery in gator, everything kind of rubbery. We'll talk about this on the road, it's quite interesting. Then we've got a little slot for tiny, tiny things. That's just the right size for half of a Bounty Duo, so you could put half your chocolate bar in there for later. And coin holders, because it's the 80s, everyone had coin holders in the cars. I've never used a coin holder. Then we have quite an interesting thing, because this is an actual proper off-roader, we have got a high and low transfer box. So currently we're in two high, we've also got four wheel high, neutral and four low. So if you want to go into the, so for everyday use, we stick it in two wheel drive high, that's rear wheel drive, bimble about, better fuel economy, more nimble. If you want to go off-road, gets a bit slippery, you start snowing, stick it in four high. If you want to do serious off-roading, drop it into four low and we are good to go. And there's even a big stick here explaining the operation of the transfer case. This is uh, she describes as four-wheel drive, low speed for severe driving conditions, less than 35 mph. 
Now moving backwards, we've got the handbrake obviously, but here we have a real curious placement for the electric window switches. Only two of them because it's a two-door car, or three-door technically, but first of all the position is down here between the seats. Not that unusual, but the fact is they've been rotated 90 degrees, so you've got to try and figure out, hmm, that passenger or is that driver? Hmm, curious. But yeah, that is where it sits and it's absolutely fascinating. I love a little quirk like that. Overhead, we have got a couple of points of interest. First of all, now this, fascinatingly, is an air freshener that came with the car from brand new. It's never left the uh, mirror. Thank you for your custom classic car center up in Essex. Got the 0268 number on there. So it's actually pre the phone number change back in the mid nineties. Incredible stuff. Um, up above that, we've got our twin uh, courtesy lights, uh, rocker switches to turn them on and off. Fascinating, love it. Tons and tons of headroom in here because big square blocky off-roader. And we've got ourselves a central light switch there, grab handles in the back as well. Let's jump in the back and have a look at what it's like in there. Well, this being the three-door version, we don't have a rear door, obviously. So flip the seat forward to climb in. We do have a nice little storage tray in the side of the driver and passenger seats, handy for keeping things in. Let's climb in. Quite easy to get into because there is so much headroom. Pull this back. Now I've actually got a reasonably large amount of, um, of legroom in here and tons of headroom. Interesting thing with these seat backs, because they are two individual seats, so the thing does fold forward like on a Jimny, you can choose the angle of rake on your seat backs. So if you want to give a bigger load space, you can sit that forward or you can just notch it back to a couple of different positions to a more comfortable recline position. So better for passengers, better for luggage. Here in the sides of both sides of the car, we have got big storage bin for passenger stuff, a little ashtray for passenger stuff, and a speaker in both sides. And the carpet, quite curiously, rolls all the way up here, and these seats will fold completely flat forward into the footwell, giving you basically a small van. Well, actually quite a large van when that's happened. They put a bit of fresh air in here behind the heat seat belts. There's only two seat belts, there's only two seats. We've got little pop-out side opening windows. And last but not least, back here we have got push to open an extra hidden little cubby hole. It feels very, very plasticky indeed. It's like a bluey, grey, black plastic colour stuff. But I quite love this little push the button, it pops up and it doesn't actually spring open. You just have to then lift it. But we've got a plastic storage area for just about big enough for audio cassettes, I reckon. One more little Vitara Easter egg. Roll the driver's seat all the way forward and look what you find. It's the jack and wheel brace. Because the boot is really quite small, we'll look at that in a second, this is the best place to hide it. So they tucked it away under here. Now before we move around to the back, we need to use the unlock lock buttons to release the rear doors so we can get into it. When we get round here, like on our proper off-roader, the spare wheel is mounted outside here on the boot for easy access when you're off-roading and getting dirty and muddy, but also maximising the interior space. This looks like it should be a number plate light and plinth as well as a door handle, but it's not. That's just the door handle. The number plate is down here. Now these tail lights are very interesting. You'll notice they have got a complete cutout in the rear of the side wing, but because of regulations that mean when the doors open it still has to be visible and they will be blocked by the spare wheel, for European cars and possibly Americans as well, the tail lights have moved down into the main bumper and this is just a fog light. The boot itself, not massive, interesting, not massive, because it's very plasticky plastic lining on the door itself, heated rear window. Um, not a lot of space in the boot though. Better if you do roll the seats forward, or indeed roll them all flat and then do your twisty things to lift it all the way up. I can't do it one-handed, so I won't, but there you go. And interesting how powerful a flip this strut has. It chucks the door open with quite a bit of force. Right, let's get on the road. Right, let's get the Vitara on the road. Now this is, incredibly, a carburetted version, but it does have an auto choke, which means it starts up relatively easily, well, very easily, and away we go. Now it's got a 1.8 litre four-cylinder normally aspirated engine. But when it was first launched in Japan, it made 80 horsepower, 79 horsepower. Right-hand indicators. You may have noticed the uh, triangle of doom just there. That was a deliberate test. But when the car moved over to the UK, it, for some reason, was given a carburetor making five horsepower less. 
but that was, of course, auto choked, so it was not all bad news. And the gearbox on this thing is a proper off-roader style gearbox, like a classic Range Rover. It's a long wand. It's a bit wavery through the gearbox, kind of rubbery to find your access point to each next ratio, but really, really light. I mean, it feels like you're barely moving anything at all in there. And when I say it's long and rubbery and weird, it's not vague at all. This is as tight as a drum. It just has a lot of movement to it. And this, I believe, is completely correct to how the car should be. Also interesting is the clutch pedal, which has the longest travel down to the floor of any clutch I think I've ever driven. It's also incredibly light, which does mean the first time you climb into it, finding the biting point is quite tricky because you're kind of unsure exactly when it's going to catch. There's no, no forewarning under your foot. Now, it's by no means a rapid car. I thought maybe I was in danger of breaking the speed limit for a second then, but in fact, it's only doing 40 miles an hour. It does bounce and jounce along like crazy. It's got McPherson struts at the front, coil springs all round, and a De Dion rear end, which I was astonished to learn. It's also got anti-roll bars, so you can do a bit of this, and the, um, well, they don't do a lot, let's be honest. It rolls a lot. It's basically a serious off-roader that's been designed to look good in the city. Because, thanks to the Jimny, Suzuki have got proper off-road credentials. There's a lot of people would have a Jimny over pretty much anything else, including a Defender or a G-Wagon, because those things get everywhere. This is just a little bit larger, because if you've been in a Jimny, you know how compact they are. This gives you a little bit more elbow room, a bit more headroom, more luggage space, more everything room really. But all they've done is taken out the diff locks. It's got selectable four wheel drive and the low range. It just, just doesn't have the diff locks. That's all you're missing. But the uh, Vitara evolved rapidly through its life. It changed a lot. Initially, it went on sale in the middle of 1988 in Japan only, and then followed around the rest of the world very rapidly. First of all, it was only available as a three door, the hard top and the soft top, and in the UK, the hard top only at first. By 1990, they decided the 8 valve 1.8 wasn't quite enough, so they put a 1.8 16 valve in there, which gave better performance, more power. In 1990, they decided they'd be able to appeal to a wider audience with a five door. So they lengthened the chassis, gave an extra set of back doors, bigger boot. Uh, but to their massive surprise, it didn't just appeal to the same core buyers who wanted a bit more space. It opened up to a massive new customer base and their order books pretty much exploded. Also in 1990, they decided to add ABS on the rear wheels. And in 1991, that five-door version made it over to Europe. Perhaps the biggest change came in 1994, when they did a big deal with Mazda. They wanted other engines. They wanted a diesel and they wanted a V6, and Mazda had both. A nice two-litre V6 and a nice two-litre diesel. So, but in order to get those, they did a deal with Mazda, which allowed Mazda to sell the car as its own vehicle. They called it the Proceed Levante. So you could say I'm driving a Levante, but I've not been anywhere near a Maserati today. But that does bring me on to the names, because this had a whole bunch of names around the world. It was built in loads of different places as well. In its home market in Japan, in its home market in Japan, it was known as the Escudo. Unless, of course, it was the five door, in which case it was known as the Nomade, which is Nomad with an E on the end. In America, it was called the Sidekick and sold in collaboration with General Motors. Interestingly, it was also built in Spain by Santana, who are notable for doing their Land Rover Defender versions as well. Not only did they do their passenger car versions, they also did a commercial version, a three-door panel van, a Peugeot XUD9 1.9 litre, and if you bought a Vitara commercial here in the UK, that's what you got as well. Now, I have to say, I've not seen an example of a Vitara anywhere near as clean as this in absolutely years. And that's probably because they've rusted away to nothing, and the ones that weren't rusting away to nothing were bought by off-roaders who just loved them for their 
lightweight, small size, and incredible abilities. You can just use them to death. I imagine there are loads of really knocked about ones in garages and in gardens around the countries of the world, waiting to disappear into a woodland glade at the drop of a hat. But immaculate, unmodified ones like this are absolute hen's teeth. And that's another thing. The modifications, because this came out in the early 90s, and this is just as the max power craze was about to get going. And this is when the modification style of the era was big, fat, wide body arches, big side graphics, all that kind of stuff. Loads of these were modified. This is almost not how I remember the cars like this. I remember them with the body kits on there. And uh, talking to a friend at Suzuki UK, he actually thinks that they were a dealer fit option to have those big body kits put on there. No idea who created them, but yeah, you could go to your Suzuki dealer, buy yourself a brand new Vitara and have it kitted out with the wide arch stuff from the get-go. Now over in Italy, this car is actually responsible for a change in the law. There was a loophole in their import quotas where if you had an off-roader, there was no limit. You could bring in as many as you wanted and sell as many as you wanted. And so Suzuki, for the first little while, were shifting bucket loads of these things. Unfortunately, the Italian authorities got wise to this and in early 1989, they actually changed the law to say that your off-roader had to have a locking differential, at least one of them, somewhere in the vehicle. And this doesn't, so it fell foul of the new rule. So basically, they changed the law specifically for this car. Now I remember back in the early 1990s, my dad won one of those modified wide body graphicked up three door soft top ones of these things for a competition at work and he had it for about a week or so. And I remember taking it out around town with a few friends, top down music up, looking like the biggest bunch of idiots you've ever seen but loving every minute. That is how I remember these Vitaras. They were flash, they looked good. They were a moment in time that was just fun to be in. They weren't, they were great off-roaders. They were, like a Jimny, they were just bouncy and all over the place, but huge, huge fun to be in. Which I guess is why they were so popular. It may not be dynamically perfect, like an MX-5, for example, but they are just enormous fun to be in. It's just a huge smile on your face all the time. Once you get a hang of that wibbly wobbly gear shift, <laughs> it's really easy as they always are. But it's just a bit of a shock when you're expecting something nice and drum tight being Suzuki. And it's uh, more like a Range Rover. Bit of a surprise. This has been an absolute joy driving this car. I've not been in one of these things for absolutely years and I've loved every minute of it. So much fun. If you've enjoyed this, please, as always, hit like and subscribe and join me again next time driving something completely different.